So I'm standing in the chapel in Abney Park, um, roughly halfway through my journey into the Magnificent Seven. Um, I became involved in these amazing Victorian cemeteries in 2014 in West Norwood. And I've been writing a book about every one of the cemeteries with a simple goal in mind, to find a great lost and forgotten poet in these cemetery grounds. Um, this is taking me in all kinds of directions and uncovering all kinds of stories and all kinds of different approaches to poetry. Um, I am intrigued by Abney Park as a garden, as a berry garden just off the high street. Um, this comes out of a story by Arthur Mackin called N, in which he says there is a beautiful transitory garden in Stoke Newington, but it's only seen by the few. And my book, Berry Garden, is making the claim that Abney Park Cemetery is that garden. Um, whilst I'm exploring this idea, I'm unearthing all kinds of poets. Um, I'm going to talk to you at this event tonight, about eight of them, um, give you a little introduction to the work, um, and then talk about them later, answer questions about them. Um, as you would expect in Ab Abney Park, uh, the idea of non-conformism features highly, um, ideas of the resurrection and the second coming features highly. Um, but graffiti also features highly as well. I'm interested in this garden as a lived in space um, and graffiti as a kind of mark making between the living and the dead. Um, when we're confronted with death in um, chapels um, and burial grounds, it's an instinct to make a mark to kind of uh, affirm our own lives. And writing is, is related to that. All these people who were buried here um, have lived with a conviction they had something to say uh, and something to be remembered by. Um, and it's just a real pleasure to be able to find their stories and to find the work, to read their work by their graveside um, and to put it into a book and to think about it and to wrestle with this big question, why do we remember some poets but not others? Um, and this is um, a question that gets me out of bed every morning and gets me thinking about literature, um, who will be read in the future um, and who will have not only popularity in their lives, but also posterity. I'm standing on Watts's Mound, um, this uh, corner of the cemetery that Isaac Watts was known to write his poetry. Um, and Watts is such an important figure in terms of the poets of Abney Park. Um, there are very, very few poets who uh, could be said to have influenced William Blake, and Isaac Watts is one of them. Um, he wrote these um, divine and moral songs for children, um, and it's more than likely that William Blake had read these poems. In fact, I think William Blake responded to some of these poems by Watts, um, Watts wrote about the rose, how fair is the rose, what a beautiful flower, the glory of April and May, but the leaves are beginning to fade in an hour and they wither and die in a day. And William Blake wrote his really famous poem, O Rose Thou Art Sick, that invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. And what you can see in Blake is that he's taken a cue from Watts. Watts is laying down these poems about uh, death in the image of a flower and Blake transforms it into something a little bit more sinister and a little bit darker. And that's exactly what he did throughout the poems of Innocence and Experience. Um, Watts is a prolific writer, someone who asks us to interrogate our relationship with God and with Jesus. And Blake absolutely took that on as well. Um, and there are a few poets that I've found in my journey around the Magnificent Seven who can be said to have really created a whole new genre of poetry. And Watts absolutely did that with the hymn. We could you know, talk at length about hymns and poetry and where the two meet. Um, but he began this new proliferation of hymn writing, which had a huge impact on the culture. Um, and we know that he sat here to write. Um, this is a unique 
um, figure in the Magnificent Seven because there are no other poets that I know of who wrote their poetry uh, in the landscape that would become the cemetery itself. Um, and it, there's a nice kind of um, fittingness, I think, to the fact that Isaac Watts is buried in Bunhill Fields, just a couple of miles away with William Blake. So the two dissidents are together in that landscape um, and both continuously being read today. So I'm next to the grave of Emily Goss, um, really interesting Victorian figure. Um, she loved nature, she was born in London but she spent a lot of time in Wales when she was younger and this really set up her adult life because she married a naturalist, Philip Goss um, and together they would visit Devon and they would write about what they saw um, and she was also a landscape painter as well as being a writer um, so she was a real polymath and drawing a lot of her creative energy from the natural landscape. Um, she is someone who's been written about a lot since she died. Um, a cultural memory of her has uh, kind of like reshaped who she was. Um, and her body in a strange way has been written over and over. Um, her husband wrote a book after she died called The Last Days on Earth of Emily Goss. And it was a really factual account of her illness from cancer uh, and the slow um, dissolving of her body really um, he took quite a naturalist's eye to what was happening to her um, and her son as well Edmund Goss is a really famous writer of the time um, and he wrote this controversial book um, called Father and Son and Edmund Goss really disliked the way he was brought up um, he thought um, his mum and dad were strange and slightly overzealous in their religious outlook. Um, he wrote about things like, you know, when he was tucked in to bed of a night time, uh, they would say to him, um, oh, who knows, tomorrow you might wake up and the sky will be full of archangels and it'll be the day of judgment. Um, but at the same time, he wasn't allowed to have bedtime stories. You know, they didn't believe in having fairy tales at home. Um, so he felt like his imagination was really cut off um, in a lot of ways. Um, but having said this, he did write his book Father and Son and it was a bestseller uh, and one of the most famous uh, biograph biographical books of the time. So we certainly drew a lot out of the tensions of the Victorian time. Um, she has been praised. Uh, someone called Anna Shipton wrote a book called Tell Jesus about the life of Emily and about her religious conviction and the strength of her belief. Um, and, you know, she did balance her intellectual life. She could speak Hebrew and Greek with active work in the, the East End. She would go to the East End. Um, she would get on public transport and try to con you know, convert people she thought needed some help to Jesus. Um, so there's a real um, dynamic at play there, which is really fascinating. Um, and much later in the 70s, the filmmaker Dennis Potter um, wrote a film about the life of Edmund Goss, the son, but the film um, kind of centres around the portrait of Emily Goss, which you can see on the cover of this book, a very similar portrait to this. Um, and it's exploring this Victorian world in which, you know, um, there were so many incredible tensions, but also a huge degree of creativity as well. Um, and she did, of course, write poetry, otherwise I wouldn't be here next to her grave. Uh, she wrote two books of poetry um, when she was younger. Um, they're very hard to find now. And Robert Boyd has brought them back in this biographical book with both collections of poems. Um, and, you know, I'm going to read this one and then just think about her a little bit more. Um, she wrote hymns, so very, you know, similar to Isaac Watts in that way, probably influenced a great deal by Isaac Watts. Um, a lot of them are quite direct and, um, you know, quite sanctimonious in a way. But I've chosen one which has got a little bit more texture because, you know, she's introducing an element of doubt and we, we know uh, poems about faith become a lot more interesting when doubt is in the mix as well. It's called An Evening Hymn. Another day of peace and grace now hastens to its close. I seek once more, O Lord, thy face then yield me to repose. How blessed are they 
who night and day in childlike confidence can pray. I thank thee that this day was spent in walking on toward heaven. Lord, have I sinned? I do repent. Oh, may I be forgiven. My prayer I make for Jesus' sake, that I, his spirit, may partake. Has health been mine? I thank thee, Lord, for this and every gift. To thee, for all thou dost afford, my heart in praise I lift that heart retain, for near again would I be led by trifles vain. Um, it's quite moving, I think, this poem, because she gives praise for her health, and we know, you know, she died um, of a quite painful illness. Um, and I just want to think about um, her cultural memory. We have all these books about Emily Goss, uh, but just a couple of miles north from here, next to the River Lee, uh, Unite the Union. Um, they have a building, um, a student accommodation called Emily Bowes Court um, and for some reason uh, related to what I've just said they've really taken her as a, you know, her name and her life as something which will be like a uh, shining life for students and I think that's a really you know, um, important documentation of this life that um, you know, it becomes part of London landscape um, people can come and visit this headstone here um, and you can't quite see what it says here but I've written down just before um, I came to the spot what it does say which is the dust of Emily Goss who slept in Jesus February 9th 1857 waits here the morning of the first resurrection So by the grave of a married couple, both poets, um, a recipe for disaster, you, you, history has shown in some cases, Ted Hughes, Sylvia Plath and all that. Um, and they're both very, very different writers. Um, George Banks uh, was the son of a naturalist, um, so a nature lover as well as so many others here. Um, and his po poems... Um, show his love of nature through the titles. He had collections called Blossoms of Poetry and Spring Gatherings. Um, but it seems to me he was really interested in the spoken aspect of poetry, um, the rhetorical devices that poets use. So he became a public speaker as well as a journalist. He traveled and lived all over the UK. Um, but he began to write for the stage as well. Um, and he wrote a play for one of the few black actors of the time, Ira Aldridge. Um, so you could see George's poetry was kind of moving into this performative terrain. Um, I'm always interested in uh, poets who write about London. And the, George Banks, he wrote a book about London um, called The Finger Post Guide to London. Um, and it's hard to imagine today when we've got an app for absolutely everything, but this book would have been serving a similar function to Victorians. It was called the Finger Post Guide because it had matrices in it or matrices and you could work out the price of a cab from one part of London to another. You'd find where you were going from on one axis, destination on the other, it would tell you the cost of the cab. So, you know, really useful kind of insight into London life for the Victorians. Um, and I want to read a few of his poems. Um, he was influenced by Burns a lot, so you can hear this in the poetry. Um, and one of his most famous poems, um, I live for those who love me, um, or for the good that I can do, it's called. Um, it's quite popular still on YouTube. There's a video of someone reading it in America next to a river. Um, you know, it fits in with this idea of um, Victorian goodwill uh, and, you know, the right way of living. Um, and I'll read a little extract that goes, I live for those who love me, whose hearts are kind and true, for heaven that smiles above me, and waits my spirit too, for the cause that lacks assistance, for the wrong that needs resistance, for the future in the distance, and the good that I can do. Um, but I actually prefer a later poem by him. Um, he became an alcoholic in life, and um, I think became quite disillusioned with um, the reception for his poetry. It wasn't um, as popular as many other poets at the time. 
Um, and this li- little lyric um, kind of has a, an echo of Burns behind it, I think. Lay me low, my work is done, I'm a weary, lay me low. Where the wildflowers woo the sun, where the balmy breezes blow, where the butterfly takes wing, where the aspens drooping grow, where the young birds chip and sing, I'm a weary, let me go. And he's buried here, as I say, with his wife, Isabella. Um, Isabella um, is a different kind of writer. She had more success in her life. Um, But it didn't come um, on a plate for Isabella Banks at all. She had ten children. Um, Five of those died. Um, She had um, her own um, health issues to deal with. And the way she got round becoming a writer, she would get up in the morning and she would work for between four and six hours every single day. And she wrote in this way, 12 novels, three books of short stories and three books of poetry. Um, And she was born in Manchester and there's still a sense of civic pride in Manchester for Isabella Banks. Uh, One of her novels called The Manchester Man, um, it's been uh, audio recorded onto YouTube um, and the record uh, label owner and cultural uh, dynamo, Tony Wilson, um, he actually chose some lines from Isabella Banks to put on his own headstone. And I want to read just those few lines because they say something about being forgotten or maybe being forgotten um, after death. goes like this. Mutability is the epitaph of worlds. Change alone is changeless. People drop out of the history of a life as of a land, though their work or their influence remains. So obviously this appealed to Tony Wilson, you know, hoping that his influence would remain as it has in bands like Joy Division and Happy Mondays. Um, But it has for Isabella Banks as well, because um, people still read her fiction, mostly. Um, And, you know, it's no small achievement for a writer who's been dead for 130 years to have their books in print and to have engagement from people who are are still reading it today. And I want to read just this little extract from a poem by her um, called The White World. Um, It's about the spiritual terrain between the body and the afterlife. She was very, very interested in her work, in her poetry, about uh, what happens between the moment of dying um, and whatever comes next. And the white world captures that. White world, hiding thy mysteries beneath that flimsy textured veil, mortality. Wast thou in truth revealed to the mind's eye of this sleep-fettered man in dreamy semblance, in visions that appeared reality? Or had the sound been disrobed and led by guides angelic to the gates. I'm next to the grave of Alexander Jack, a Scottish author who created quite a bit of mystique around him in his life. He was friends with Robert Louis Stevenson and he chose himself to write under a number of different aliases, uh, H.A. Page and A.N. Mountrose which makes it incredibly difficult to find his poetry as it was published. Um, This willful obscurity fits this part of the cemetery. Uh, He's buried here in quite a dense, um, overgrown part of the landscape. It fits him really well. Um, And he has a real character, Jack. He um, he wrote wrote a book in which he um, decided to um, have a pop at his friends. He were yet to acknowledge the brilliance of his own work. Um, so he, he kind of built this into his collection itself. Um, and, you know, I think what you find in his work is someone who was experimenting as someone who was trying out new forms. So he brought into English uh, a form called the Respetti. And Respetti is an Italian form, um, 11 syllable lines. It's quite a difficult uh, form to write in. And he really liked this form, he'd seen another poet use it. Uh, and he wrote a whole sequence of these respetis. 
And I'm going to read one now called The Nightingale, um, which again you can hear the bird song around us, around his grave here. Uh, and it's a really musical poem which, which fits this part of London we're in. Sweet heat of secret minstrelsy, how far thy golden notes, like lightnings in the dark, flash full, ebullient, and no rivals mar that music flooding all the moonlit park. Hold, hold, and overpower me not with pain of very sweetness, in thy keen, full strain, notes touch me to the quick, so piercing clear, I dream and think a long dead love is here. I'm standing next to the grave of William Hone. Um, he's not really a poet, he's known as the father of modern media really. He's had a lot of attention over recent years. Um, Ian Hislop co-wrote a play about his life. Um, and it's because he was a really important figure, he, um, he wrote uh, freely about the injustices in society. Um, he uh, documented the state of prisoners in Bethlehem Hospital, known as Bedlam. Um, and he also parodied the Lord's Prayer um, and he had a trial for that in court in 1817. Um, but he was also part of the writers who responded to the Peterloo Massacre, um, this really gruesome uh, repression on the streets of Manchester in 1819. Um, Shelley wrote about the Peterloo Massacre, then they will return with shame from the place from which they came and the blood thus shed will speak in hot blushes on their cheeks so it was a cause of rallying for p political poets everywhere um william home went about it a different way and he parodied um the part of the prince region in this event and also showing the disparity between royalty and the rich uh, and the poor and he did this through this um this parody of the house the Jack built, which I'll try to read for you now. Um, it goes like this. This is the man, all shaven and shorn, all covered with orders and all forlorn. The dandy of 60 with bows with a grace and has tastes in wigs, collars, curaces and lace. And when in Britain's tears sails about at his pleasure, who spare from his presence the friends of his youth, who took to his counsels in evil hour, the friend of the reasons of lawless power, the back the public informer, who will put down the thing that in spite of new acts and attempts to restrain it by soldiers or taxed, will poison the vermin that plunder the wealth that lay in the house that Jack built. So I'm next to the grave of the Reverend Dr. Hibbert Newton. His life spanned most of the Victorian period um, and he was caught up with a lot of the big ideas of his lifetime. Um, he was um, associated with the Gorham Judgment, which was uh, a controversial debate um, in the Anglican Church about um, the nature of baptism. Um, could it be a sacrament if the baby could not make their own decision? Or was it just symbolic? Um, Hibbert came down on the side of it being symbolic. Um, and although that held back his career in the church early on, he was eventually made the Reverend of St. Michael's in Southwark, um, where he lived for the last 25 years of his life. Um, he also believed in British Israelism. Um, he believed that the um, British nation was descended from one of the ten tribes of Israel. Um, this was an idea that was floating around at the time and um, he wrote a book about this, like many others did. Um, we've heard a lot today about um, the Second Coming and Resurrectionism, um, and Hibbert Newton was really interested in this. Um, it's quite an interesting idea to think about Victorians as um, millennials or pre-millennials, um, but he was obsessed with this idea uh, of, of millennial um, judgment and millennium transformation so he had the view that when the year 2000 came um, there would be a transformation it wouldn't necessarily be led by Jesus but there would be a second coming of sorts um, and it's quite an odd 
thing to think about because he also knew he wouldn't be alive to see it. Um, but at that moment, you know, as we heard um, in some of the other people buried here, you know, there were people who believed that the dead would rise. Some people believed that Jesus would return and he, you know, he would lead um, this great second epoch in Christianity. Um, he wrote many, many books. One of them was called Antichrist and it's not Lars von Trier's film. Um, for Hibbert Newton, uh, Antichrist, um, it took the form of Roman Catholicism. It also took the form of the media, so he would have you know, had some similarities with William Hone as well. Um, that, you know, limited journalism was a form of Antichrist. Sounds quite dramatic, um, but he really went in for this in his book called The Flight of the Apostate, uh, an epic book, book-length poem, um, which really explores this idea of the second coming, uh, bad journalism and bad writing, and the nature of Jesus. And I'm just going to read um, a short section from a different poem by Hibbert Newton called The Song of the Creation. Um, it seems a really nice poem to read in, in this setting in Avenue Park. Eternal night, unchanged, hoar chaos and his ancient reign, dark, dismal, and vast oceans rushing might from who the fluid air, each liquid plain, each fountain flowed, each river and the boundless main. I'm standing next to the grave of Alice Cron. She was a local poet to this area. She lived uh, in Hackney and she married a, a German glove maker there and then they moved to Stamford Hill um, and her last known address is back in Hackney but other than that we don't know much about her life. Um, this is a book I'm still writing and I'm really excited by her because it says on her headstone um, Alice Cron, writer and poetess. Um, so clearly she identified first and foremost as a poet, that's always exciting to hear. Um, and part of my journey into the cemetery, as well as finding these headstones, is to uncover the work by these writers. So I spend a lot of time at the British Library, uh, a lot of time um, in various collections, um, trying to find the best work by all these writers. So by the time I've ri written this book, there'll be a lot to say about her. Um, this is a really incredible headstone with this angel in relief, but just next to it, is a, a short extract, um, four-line poem. Farewell in hope and love, in faith and peace and prayer, till he whose home is ours above unites us there. The day of judgment, Isaac Watts. When the fierce north wind with his airy forces rears up the Baltic to a foaming fury and the red lightning with a storm of hail comes rushing amain down. How the poor sailors stand amazed and tremble while a hoarse thunder like a bloody trumpet roars a loud onset to the gaping waters quick to devour them. Such shall the noise be and the wild disorder if things eternal may be like these earthly, such the dire terror when the great archangel shakes the creation, tears the strong pillars of the vault of heaven, breaks up old marble, the repose of princes, see the graves open and the bones are rising, flames all around them. Hark, the shrill outcries of the guilty wretches, lively bright horror and amazing anguish stare through their eyelids while a living worm lies gnawing within them. Thoughts like old vultures prey upon their heartstrings and the smart twinges when the eye beholds the lofty judge frowning and a flood of vengeance rolling before him. Hopeless immortals, how they scream and shiver while devils push them to the pit wide yawning, hideous and gloomy, to receive them headlong. Stop here, my fancy, all away, ye horrid, doleful ideas. Come, arise to Jesus, how he sits godlike, and the saints around him throned, yet adoring. Oh, may I sit there when he comes triumphant, dooming the nations. 
then ascend to glory while our hosannas all along the passage shout the Redeemer. Maybe what people are thinking, I just, um, yeah, just want to say uh, it was incredible watching that because it was all recorded on the same day and it looked like the weather was taking place at about five different days. <laughs> um, I didn't quite notice it at the time, but, um, and somehow the weather seemed to suit whoever I was talking about at that moment. Um, you know, it was like the nightingale, it was really sunny and it was quite lovely. And then I was talking about the second coming and the wind was getting up and it was like this big storm was brewing. Um, and I actually think that um, that black <laughs> thing in the video is some kind of pixelated poltergeist that was following me around. And it was probably following me around in the cemetery as well. I just didn't notice. I have a question. Can I put it to you? Please. Uh, knowing the cemeteries really well and how overgrown they are, how on earth did you find them? <laughs> um, with the help of um, Zach and Hayden at the, um, at the cemetery um, in the Trust. Um, really brilliant and quite amazing, actually, because this is the fourth book I've written and um, I've never been able to find all of the graves in, in, for the other books, you know, for the poets. I've tried, but it's not always been possible. Um, and we found every single one. Um, I mean, Hayden is just, like, incredible. I don't know, you know, whether she's got, like, a bit of, um, you know, sniffer or something in her, but she just goes into the undergrowth and she, she, she leaves um, hazard tape for me to find them. So, like... Um, when Zach and I were making the film, we were walking around the cemetery looking for the hazard tape. And it was like, yeah, it's around here somewhere. And then if we couldn't find it, Zach could get on the phone and call Hayden. And Hayden could remember exactly, you know, where where they were buried. And, you know, I've been back since. And, you know, it's, I spend ages finding them. I struggle to find them again. It's like the cemetery moves, you know, like, or the graves move or something like that. Um, but the other thing to say is, most of these poets, for some reason, in Apley Park, are buried um, on the, the path side. Right. Really, really unusual. Um, you know, uh, Alexander Jap, who, the, the Scottish guy who was squatting down by his grave. I mean, he is more usual of what you have to do to find a dead poet in London. You have to, like, you know, kind of uh, roll up your sleeves and, and get into the nettles. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, Apley Park, the poets are... Uh, by the, the path and you know I was saying to Zach before it's such a literary part of London Stoke Newington um, and that's coming through the poets I'm finding and I just wonder actually whether you know there's something that runs through the burials in some way that they would be given prominence in Stoke Newington that would be buried near the path because they should they should be visible That's a really good question because it's about, um, you know, literary judgment, I guess, you know, which is part of the books, of course. I've set off to try and find a Hopkins or a Tennyson or an Emily Dickinson or a Christina Rossetti. Um, and um, that's what keeps me going. You know, I, I do think that there are poets equally as good who have just been lost because of chance or because they were female or because uh, they were a poet of colour or working class, whatever it might be. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I touched on the answer to this really before. Uh, I associate Stoke Newington with literary culture, you know, with um, with a lot of poets. And, you know, I've, been, I've read my poetry myself and seen poets read a lot in Stoke Newington. Um, so it doesn't surprise me um, to have this rich vein of dead poets in, in the cemetery at all. Um, 
and you know th there's a real affinity of course it's at the center cemetery you know it's a non-conformist cemetery um and you know that is um th that's just a close affinity with poets as non-conformists you know as dissenters um so a lot of the poets i'm talking about you know the the reverence or they were uh, religious and um it was a time of great invention you know the, the the victorian cemetery and you see that in religion you know a lot of these people were making up their own belief system and then going to preach it you know the bible is like this central thing this central text which actually can be interpreted in all these different ways um and you know if if someone didn't like what they were hearing they, they made up their own um you know cosmology around the bible and went and set up their own church and went went to teach what they believed the truth was and while whilst doing that they were writing poetry and closely associated hymns and that's another strain running through Abney Park is um hymn writers um you know and hi the hymn is a kind of poem we don't really think of that anymore but for people writing after Isaac Watts you know the hymn was a kind of poetry and it could be read or it could be sung um and I think it's something which is being lost actually in literary culture now has said, I've noticed that there is a blue plaque of Philip and Edwin Goss on the Beauvoir Road, but not Emily. Uh, let's, uh, I didn't know that. That's um, really sad. It uh, doesn't surprise me at all. Um, you know, in fact, um, Isabella Varley Banks, who I was talking about in the film, um, when it cuts to Tony Wilson's grave, you can see that the... Um, um, the credit to the poem is to G. Linnaeus Banks. And I thought they've miscredited that poem to her husband at first, but her book was published under her husband's name, uh, or a married name, sorry, I should say, which is exactly the same as her husband's name, um, G. Linnaeus Banks. It, you know, it's just really, uh, it's just galling, really, that someone can create something um, and, you know, shape their art to such a, place where they can release it to the world and it somehow um, has to go under the name of, of the husband um, yeah and you know Philip and Edmund and, and not Emily I mean that's really really bad I mean um, you know Emily is such a great writer and um, you know has a unique vision different from Philip um, and I think, you know, you could go further. I mean, Philip's book about Emily dying, the last days of Emily Goss on earth. I mean, he's writing about her like he writes about one of his natural subjects. Um, you know, he was a naturalist and he, everything was under the lens with, with Philip Goss. Um, and somehow that's what it makes me think about is kind of like Emily being under underneath his lens somehow. Um, so I think we should do something about that. Um, and you know, get, get a campaign together to put that right, because it's because it's not right at all. Um, so we have another question. Um, Anna Letitia, Letitia Barabal, the 18th century poet associated with Stoke Newington, is she not buried in that name? Um, she, she won't be. I think Anna... Oh, but I might be wrong. She wrote um, quite um, racy poems for the time, I think. Um, if I'm thinking of the, the, the right poet, she's really, really good. Um, she's not buried in, in Abney Park. Abney Park was opened in 1840 or 41 or 39, or Zach, you should look at it. I hate him so much. I, I, I... Oh, right. I yeah, it's, I think, so it's either 39 or 40 or 41, I think. I think. Um, so, you know, um, she was too early to be buried in in um, Abney Park. I mean, she may be buried in Bunhill Fields. That was the de facto dissenter cemetery of, of that part of London be, before Abney Park came along. So uh, I'm interested now. I'll go and look, look into that. It'd be nice to think she's 
buried in the same place as William Blake. Uh, uh, someone just said that she's buried at St Mary's Old Churchyard. So that's one just down. Um, oh yeah. By that yeah. Church Street. Um, so another question: Is that book still in print? The Last Days in Earth book. Um, so it's not in print as far as I know, but if you um, go to the British Library catalogue, um, you can read the PDF of it. Um, the British Library catalogue is just the most incredible thing in the world and it has allowed me to write this book during lockdown. Um, and even in the seven years I've been working on this project, the amount of stuff they've digitised has been incredible. Um, so I can read like probably or 50% of the work by these dead poets just from the British Library catalogue for free. Um, and that, that book is definitely one of them that's available to read there. Um, are there any more questions at all before we wrap up? I don't want anyone going with a question unanswered. In that case, uh, Maybe, uh, if I could just say, yeah, just before we close off, just to thank everyone for joining. Um, it's really amazing to be able to share this work because it's, you know, as always, writing a book is quite a lonely business. Um, so it's really great to be able to share it with you. And the idea, I mean, the book will definitely come out in October with Pending the Margins. Um, and we're talking with Zach and the other good people at Abney Park about an event for Halloween or thereabouts. Um, which will be real and live and in the space, um, a walking tour performance type thing. It's still taking shape. So it'd be really brilliant to, you know, be able to be graveside as it were with you uh, around the autumn and, you know, to um, approach it maybe from a different angle with some live performance and that kind of thing as well. Just one thing we do to... have a, another question. Um, which is your favorite of the Magnificent Seven? Abney Park, of course. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Zach asked me this the other day. I mean, what, whatever one I'm working on is my favourite. Um, but, you know, I do feel like I'm, I'm going deeper and deeper into Abney all the time. The book's called Berry Garden. And um, I just can't finish the first draft because I keep finding more things I need to write about. Um, one thing leads to another. Um, and... You know, I'm not sure what my editor's going to make of this because I should be like wrapping up <laughs> by where I count the book at this point. But, um, you know, it, it does keep kind of um, new shoots keep emerging from the berry gardens to use, to use that metaphor. Um, so, yeah, Abney, Abney for me at the moment. Um, another question Is there any logic to the order with which you've written about the cemeteries? Yeah, there is um, a logic. Uh, I started at West Norwood, which is the most southerly. Um, by chance, I was commissioned as a poet to respond to uh, West Norwood uh, as part of an uh, outdoor commission. Um, and then I realised that I wanted to talk about the dead poets rather than to talk about something from I made up, for example. Um, and then I, I wrote a blog about what I'd found and then I realised it was more than a blog, it was a book. Um, and then, you know, got the, my amazing publisher, Pender the Margins, um, interested in the book. And we're traveling southerly, you know, the most southern cemetery to the most northern. So it will end at Highgate um, and or most centrally northern at Highgate anyway. Um, so I've finished in the south. I've written um, in the catacombs about West Norwood and um, Cenotaph South about Nunhead, and I've written the East Edge about Tower Hamlets. So I'm in the east part of the city at the moment, writing um, Berry Garden about Abney Park. And then I'm going to move over to the west of the city and um, write a book about Brompton and about Kensal Green, um, and then finish um, a high gate uh, where I know. There's at least 30 dead poets waiting for my attention. <laughs> um, someone once said to me, by the time I finish this project, I'll be ready to join the, the uh, dead poets of London. Uh, oh, that's not the case. Yeah, that's right. And of course, yeah, Christina Rossetti is in Highgate and Harold Pinter and um, yeah, so much to, to talk about and think about with, with Highgate. Um. 
sorry, there are some people trapped in the cemetery. Um, the, another question saying, um, are, do you think there are more poets in Abney Park to discover? Yeah, um, almost definitely. Um, that's why I keep writing. I keep finding more poets that keep popping up. Um, that was probably probably a couple of dead poets at your door then, Zach. I wouldn't be <laughs> um, you know, one of the things of this project for every cemetery, um, I think pretty much for every cemetery, new poetry connections have emerged after I've finished the book. And I quite like that because I do everything I can to find what I can. Um, but if something in the books like raises awareness in people, uh, it's something worth thinking about or something to carry on. And people have started their own projects around the dead poets afterwards, which I really like as well. So, you know, I think it's not like my book is the end of like, you know, the dead poets of Abney Park. Um, hopefully more will continue, you know, to emerge over the coming years as well. Um, I'll throw another. Um, I'll throw this question at you, and then I have to go unlock the gate. Um, what do you think of Nunhead now that it's been tidied up? Uh, um, I've not been to Nunhead. Well, I've not barely been in London for, for a year. Actually, that was uh, Abney Park was um, the second time I've been in London for for a year to make this film, um, which was probably why I looked a bit stunned <laughs> sensory overload just walking through London again it was quite amazing and bizarre um but I haven't seen Nunhead since it's been tidied up um I mean uh, one of the things I wrote a lot about Nunhead in Cenotaph South was that it is basically an urban forest um and there are stories of people you know who work in in the cemetery who you know got, went in one day to do a little bit of work around some graves a bit of tidying up and like you know, it took them five hours to find the way out. <laughs> I don't know how exaggerated these stories were, but like, it definitely seemed true to me that you could get lost for a very, very long time in Nunhead and that, that is the cemetery's charm, you know. Um, but, you know, having said this, there's a, a balance in act, you know, between allowing these spaces to run wild and then to attract the birds and the the, the flora and everything that they're, they're known for and that they give us this breathing space in London. But if they're not maintained, um, they can be dangerous. I mean, Ab Abney is, has many tree, you know, fallen trees from storms, you know, really old ancient trees. You know, that, that's a consideration for people who look after the cemetery. And it's the same with the um, mausolea, you know, um, stat you know, um, monument slide, um, angels fall, you know, pedestals break, obelisks topple over. Um, and, you know, that can be obviously really, really dangerous. So um, I know in the people at Nunhead, I can guarantee everything's been done with real care and real consideration to get that balance and act right between allowing it to be natural, but allowing it to be like a safe, welcoming space as well. Um. Right, that possible. I mean, any any last questions, please feel free. Um, I do want to say, I mean, again, thank you, Chris, for doing this. It was so interesting. It was a real joy also working on it, but, you know, a very interesting thing to do. And thank you very much for everyone coming in. You know, the things like this is how we stay surviving in lockdown. And, you know, the money that you you thank luckily gave us is really helping. Um, we have lots of things going on. Please check them out on our website. And um, we're reopening volunteering if you feel like popping down and maintaining some graves. Um, it'd be lovely to see you. Um, so yeah, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Chris, if, do you have anything else you'd like to say? No, just to thank you all again for, for coming along. Um, and hopefully I'll see you along the path somewhere towards October. Um, and yeah, and in, in London and in the National Poetry Library, which reopens on the 28th of May, I'm sure many of you are missing that space as well. So that's something really, really nice to look forward to. Right, wonderful. Okay, well, have a lovely evening, people. Bye-bye.